Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Parry Sharma. I'm a consultant vascular surgeon at 108 Harley Street. Um, I'm sure you have joined us on some of these sessions previously. Um, we thought in these challenging times it would be best to have a virtual CPD session. So we came up with the idea of these um, snippet CPD sessions, which are essentially bite-sized um, sessions where we talk about one topic um, for a time of about 20 minutes with some 12 or 12 odd slides. Um, uh, you may have sort of joined me for my previous session uh, a couple of weeks ago when I talked about um, peripheral vascular disease. Today, I'll be talking about aneurysms. Um, and as you can see on this picture here, um, the aorta, um, as it gives off branches to the kidneys, dilates. And you can see a significant caliber change from the suprarenal segment of the aorta into the infrarenal segment just above the aortic bifurcation. And this is what we call an aneurysm. So how do we define an aneurysm? I think the best way to define an aneurysm is uh, as a localized dilatation of an artery. But the important thing here to remember is that it has to be by more than half of its original diameter. If the dilatation is less than half, we term that ectasia. One slide about the pathophysiology and the epidemiology of aneurysms. Um, the aortic wall is made up of smooth muscle cells and the protein elastin and collagen. And there is a constant remodeling um, going on within tissues, as I'm sure you're aware, that is the process by which older cells are constantly replaced by younger cells. And this process of remodeling is what is thought to be at the heart of aneurysmal change. There is a process called destructive remodeling where you have an imbalance between the proteolytic enzymes and their inhibitors. And as a consequence, there develops a weakness in the wall of the arteries. And hence that leads to a swelling that occurs usually in the localized area, but it could be generalized. Um, and this is what causes aneurysm formation to, to happen. Aneurysms tend to be common in um, uh, the over 60s. They tend to be commoner in men, almost four times as common. And there is a significant association with smoking. And you may be surprised to note that the smoking um, preponderance in people with aneurysms is significantly more than patients with coronary artery disease, for instance. Um, so yes, we find a significant link. They tend to be commoner in the Caucasian population. And there is also a familiar link with aneurysmal change. Um, as would be expected, it is associated with atherosclerosis, hence hypercholesterolemia. And there is also a mild association with hypertensive disease. Aneurysms can be classified by a multitude of ways. Um, uh, this picture shows you the normal arterial wall on the left with the adventitia, media and the intima. And true and false aneurysms are defined by the presence of all the three layers of the arterial wall. So true aneurysm will have all the three layers present, as you can see in the picture in the middle. And a false aneurysm will just have one, maybe, or no layers of the arterial wall. So usually it tends to be also called a pseudo aneurysm. So where you have an injury in the arterial wall, either as a consequence of instrumentation or trauma, and you can get extravasation of blood with um, a layer of the adventitia or the arterial wall accompanying it. Um, aneurysms can also be classified as congenital or acquired, and I'm sure you would recognize this picture of a berry aneurysm, which is probably the commonest congenital aneurysm that we talk about. Aneurysms can also be classified depending on the anatomical location. Um, so remember, we've got arteries everywhere in the body, and this, this picture just shows you the, um, the approximate sizes of the arteries um, in these locations. So aneurysms can affect any part of the body. Um, they are commonest in the aorta, the cerebral circulation, um, and also um, some aneurysms can be found in the visceral circulation as well. 
You can also classify aneurysms based on the morphology of the aneurysm. So you have the commoner fusiform variety where you have a complete or circumferential involvement of the arterial wall. Or you could get the saccular aneurysms, which are a focal outpouching, but these are not false aneurysms because they have all the three layers of the arterial wall involved. Um, a common example of a saccular aneurysm is a mycotic aneurysm or aneurysms associated with something called a penetrating aortic ulcer. They usually present as saccular aneurysms. We can also classify aneurysms depending on their etiology, so atherosclerotic aneurysms, aneurysms associated with connective tissue diseases, inflammatory aneurysms, and so on. The common um, can Connective tissue disorders associated with aneurysmal change, as I'm sure you're aware, are Marfan's, Lewy Dietz syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos. They are the commonest ones that we pick up aneurysms in. So this slide just depicts the common aneurysms that we pick up. Um, the infrarenal variety to the far right is the commonest one that we see. There is a significant um, involvement as you move along the picture to the left of the, um, the visceral segment of the aorta. And this is particularly important because the risk profile for these patients changes completely. So if you've got involvement of the, the, the renal vessels or the visceral vessels, they are at significantly more risk compared to infrarenal aneurysms when you talk about um, interventions, because any intervention to this part will involve a certain degree of ischemia that may happen to the visceral circulation. You could also get thoracoabdominal aneurysms, which involve the entire aortic length. So type 1 extent on the left, the type 4 aneurysm is the same as a suprarenal aneurysm, and you get a, a spectrum of involvement of the aortic, of the aortic length. Um, as you would expect, the more the length of the aorta that's involved in aneurysmal change, the more the risk. Um, and the risk in the thoracoabdominal region involves uh, a paraplegia risk because you compromise the blood supply to the spine when you're thinking about fixing these. And I'll touch upon the repair at the end of my presentation. This is an example of a popliteal aneurysm. So the image on the left, you can see this is a fluoroscopy. Um, image with contrast lining the popliteal artery. Um, the, the actual aneurysm is not very well projected on this on the left, but you can see a caliber change. Um, and these aneurysms, if you remember from my talk last time, I talked about distal embolization. This is the commonest presentation for popliteal aneurysms. They present with acutely ischemic limbs. Um, and once a patient has an acutely ischemic limb in the presence of a popliteal aneurysm, they have um, a poor prognosis in terms of their limb salvage rate. So we quote percentages of about 50%. Um, so that is a significant uh, problem, hence why we want to pick these patients up early. This is all relevant because of this. Um, the aneurysm population, as I suggested in my earlier slide, it, it tends to be patients above the age of 60. Um, and we have, a, we have an aging population in the West. Um, our peak, the, the number of people over the age of 60 has doubled in the last 40 years, and it's expected to double again by 2050. And this will cause a significant burden to our healthcare systems. This is a graph um, showing mortality figures of people with aneurysms. And again, as you can see here, there is a significant um, trend towards people in the age group of 65 to 85 um, presenting and succumbing to aneurysms. Um, this slide also shows you uh, a significant male predisposition um, in people with aneurysms. And some, uh, some, figures will, some, some papers will quote a four times um, figure uh, of men being affected as compared to women. That said, when aneurysms present in women, they tend to be more aggressive um, they rupture at um, smaller sizes. So it's important to remember that. A quick slide about history and examination. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, aneurysms tend to be asymptomatic. They will not present, and they usually, they will not present with symptoms, and they're usually picked up as an incidental finding when patients come in for a scan for another reason. 
There are, however, instances where patients will present with weak back or abdominal pain. They can present with distal embolization. So you can get people coming on presenting to you with ulcers in their feet or trash appearance of sort of um, uh, punched out lesions or small blister hemorrhages and things like that. Um, and the key is to examine them to check to look out for popliteal aneurysms. And sometimes even abdominal aneurysms can present like that. Um, some unusual presentations include an aorto cable or an aorto enteric fistula. And these, these tend to be quite a significant um, uh, presentation because patients will be quite unwell with this. Um, examination, the commonest thing that we find on examination is a palpable pulsatile mass. Um, so we used to tell, I used to tell my students um, when examining for popliteal pulses that if you can actually feel a popliteal pulse, make sure it's not aneurysmal because it's, it's one of the most difficult pulses to feel in the body. And if you're feeling like a strong popliteal pulse, think in terms of a popliteal aneurysm. Um, abdominal examination can pick up um, aneurysms, um, but that sensitivity is only about 60%. The sensitivity as expected is directly proportional to the size of the aneurysm. So the larger the aneurysm, the more likely you are to detect it on abdominal examination and it is inversely proportional to the abdominal girth. So if you've got somebody with a high BMI, it may be quite difficult to pick up um, an abdominal aneurysm. They can sometimes present with a rupture. This is a CT scan of my last um, rupture that I repaired. This gentleman was quite lucky because he had a, um, a retroperitoneal rupture, which tends to contain um, the aorta or, or the bleed um, and this gentleman had an urgent open repair um, that I did, and thankfully he's, he's still with us, and this was um, a few months ago. Um, this is what we want to prevent from happening. So the idea is to try and detect these aneurysms before they progress to, to rupturing. Um, I caught um, patients' figures of about 25% survival if they present with a rupture, um, or if they have a rupture. A couple of trials, um, these landmark trials is where our um, treatment um, thresholds have come from. So they were published at the turn of the century. The one on the left is the UK small aneurysm trial. Um, and this, this is the landmark study. That's, that's where the figure of five and a half centimeters for abdominal aortic aneurysms and threshold for repair comes from. They looked at um, people with smaller sized aneurysms and compared their surgical risk versus the risk of leaving the aneurysm alone. And they found out that at about five and a half centimeters when those two risks balance out. So what we do is we, we monitor patients with smaller sized aneurysms till they get to five and a half and then counsel them and talk to them about the appropriateness for an intervention at that stage. Um, I'm sure you'd be aware of this, but since um, 2013, the NHS has been offering um, a screening program where men at the age of 65 are offered an ultrasound scan to look at their aortas. Um, this, these figures are from last year, so you can see a prevalence rate of roughly about 1.3 to 1.5% um, in the UK. So at their scan, if um, their aorta is found to be more than three centimeters in size, then it's termed aneurysmal. So at that, in, in, at that point, if the aorta is less than three centimeters, these men are discharged from the screening service. But if their aorta is between three and 4.4, they will be invited to have yearly scans. And if their aortas are between 4.5 and 5.4 centimeters, they'll have more frequent scans every three months. If they are picked up with an aneurysm of 5.5 centimeters or above, they're immediately referred to the vascular service and undergo a timely repair if appropriate. So how do you treat aneurysms? Um, we, I touched upon peripheral vascular disease. During my peripheral vascular disease lecture, I touched upon best medical treatment. And it's a similar sort of profile for these patients. So the important thing is to give them advice about smoking cessation, lifestyle, about, lifestyle advice about changing their diet, exercise, 
antiplatelets, antihypertensives, and lipid lowering agents. And then obviously, if they are suitable, they will go down the surgery pathway. The surgery pathway could be open repair, which involves a laparotomy, which is a big cut right in the middle, to go in and replace the aneurysmal aorta with a fabric tube. So here you can see in the picture, um, the aneurysm sac is, has been opened up and the aorta has been replaced with this fabric dacron tube, which has been sutured up there and down here. Um, since the late 90s, we have been performing endovascular repair as well. And this figure uh, essentially shows uh, the femoral artery being exposed in the groin, and you require this to access the circulation. Um, for the last 10 to 15 years, we've been using percutaneous access. So this is a percutaneous closure device where through a small cut in the groin, we can access the femoral artery and this device helps to close the artery. And this is what the groins look like after we've done the percutaneous repair. So you can see this really small size of the, the incision that these patients will come to you with if you see them after their repair. But essentially, this is this is what we do. So you can see this is a um, a fabric um, a stent graft, which is um, how I describe to patients is a metallic scaffold with a fabric cover, and this is a bifurcated tube. So it's sitting just below the arteries to the kidneys, going across and sealing in the common iliac arteries bilaterally above the internal iliac. The idea is that the entire blood flow is carried through the stent graft and you're excluding the aneurysm from the circulation. So taking away the risk. Um, there are pros and cons to both repairs. Um, if you have uh, involvement of the visceral segment, these are slightly more specialized grafts which we use nowadays, um, where you have special fenestrations and scallops to, to, to keep the, um, the renal arteries, the, the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac artery in circuit and fused. The last uh, fenestrate repair um, that I performed on a patient not so long ago, the completion angiogram, um, you can see the celiac artery has been stented as has been the SMA and the two renals and the bifurcated graft lining and sitting in the iliac arteries. Um, pros and cons um, for open repair, we tend to reserve that for people who are very fit, um, who will withstand a, a big operation, a laparotomy. They tend to be in hospital for at least about five to seven days, um, and then they're discharged from the advantage being that once you fix them, their risk of requiring any further intervention is quite low as compared to the endovascular um, repair, which is associated roughly with a 10% risk of um, reintervention. And that may be either a balloon angioplasty or an extension cuff or embolization of an ongoing endo leak. Um, the key points to take away from my talk today is aneurysms are commonest in men between the ages of 60 to 80. If you're unsure about a diagnosis, consider an ultrasound scan. Early detection is the key um, for these patients. We don't want to send them down the rupture pathway at full if we can avoid it. Um, and refer if you're unsure about um, their presentation or their symptoms or your examination, or they fall outside the remit of the screening program. Um, just highlighting the address, the email addresses for referrals. Um, at the top, if you had any comments, recommendations or suggestions about the, my talk today or any suggestions for future topics that you'd like me to cover, please do drop us an email on um, the second email and I'll just put my um, personal email address on there as well if you had any questions. Many thanks.